Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Total Synthesis episode, we'll take a look at the total synthesis of Pura Mutalin by the Reisman Group. There's plenty to go through, so let's get right to it. Pura Mutalin is a complex diterpenoid natural product which can bind to bacterial ribosomes and inhibit protein synthesis. This is one representation of Pura Mutalin, but to look at the Reisman Group's retrosynthetic analysis of this target, let's go ahead and redraw this in a more 3D way. They imagined the final target as a more elaborated form of this intermediate, which could be seen as the product of a ketyl radical cyclization or a radical conjugate addition. That transformation was proposed to occur under the action of samarium diiodide. At this point in the analysis, I want to quickly pause and take a look at another time that samarium diiodide has been employed in radical cyclization in pursuit of poor mutilin. In the Proctor group's prior synthesis of this target, they began from this dialdehyde starting material and subjected it to samarium diiodide in order to access this polycyclic product through an impressive cyclization cascade. They started by generation of a ketyl radical, which was able to undergo a radical conjugate addition to form, after a further one electron reduction, a samarium enolate, which was able to undergo a further cyclization via a chelation controlled aldol addition. This process resulted in the formation of the congested core of the target, pormutilin, where we can see the bond formed by the aldol addition in blue and the bond formed by the radical conjugate addition in red, both of which appeared in the final target. Comparing that process to the ketyl radical cyclization that's being proposed in the retrosynthesis of Reisman, we can see that the radical conjugate addition is being used to form a different bond in this case. If we do a side-by-side -side comparison, we can get an even better picture of how each route is using samarium diiodide to put together the core of the target. Now, returning to the retrosynthetic analysis of Reisman, they thought that if they could simplify their cyclization substrate even further, they might be able to use a crotulation to install the requisite appendage. This crotulation could proceed from either a Z or E crotal boronic acid starting material, which is a choice that has the potential to allow access to products that are diastereomeric at C12. The larger significance of this is that the C12 epimer of pluramidolin is also a desirable target and has recently received the attention of the pharmaceutical industry in the form of a patent. Here I want to interrupt myself once again and mention that there's been other important work on the synthesis of pluramidolin and its derivatives by the Herzon group, who's previously addressed the question of how to invert the stereochemistry at C12 using chemistry pioneered by Berner. In this transformation, the Herzon group treated this starting material with diethyl zinc and found that it was possible to invert the stereochemistry at C12 to a modest degree. The way this was proposed to occur was by forming a zinc alkoxide, which can undergo a retroallylation to form a ring open intermediate that can isomerize and reclose to reverse the stereochemistry at C12. Using this strategy, the Herzon group was able to access pluramutilin using a 12 epipluramutilin skeleton. So, returning to the Reisman retrosynthetic analysis again, let's see how they finished simplifying their intermediate. They proposed that the six-membered ring at the core of their intermediate might arise from this alpha-methylated cyclohexenone, which it turns out can be accessed through a known procedure starting from trans-dihydrocarbone. Alright, so let's check out the forward synthesis. Starting from this alpha-methylated cyclohexenone, the authors carried out a conjugate addition using an organocuprate and trapped with TMS chloride to get the sioleanol ether, which could be used in a segusa edo type desaturation reaction with palladium-2 and oxygen in DMSO to get this beta-functionalized cyclohexenone. Then, another conjugate addition allowed them to set the quaternary stereocenter in this product with relatively high diastereoselectivity. As a point of comparison, a similar conjugate addition in the Proctor route, which used a comparable nucleophile and electrophile, only provided the product in 2.5 to 1 dr. Then, having introduced the propenyl group, the authors carried out an allylic chlorination using trichlorocyanuric acid, or TCCA. They were subsequently able to close up the 5-membered ring using an aldol condensation, which resulted in a small amount of epimerization at C6, presumably due to some enol formation under the reaction conditions. Now the authors were able to employ methyl magnesium chloride and a Grignard addition in the presence of cerium trichloride, which comes from a procedure developed by the Nichelle group for ketone electrophiles that are enolizable or hindered. Subsequent treatment with PCC resulted in an oxidative transposition to provide this enone product. The allylic chloride could then be converted into an enol by employing the Kornblum oxidation using monopotassium phosphate and sodium iodide and DMSO with heat. With the aldehyde installed, they were ready to go in for the crotulation they proposed during the retrosynthetic analysis. Here they found that by employing this z crotalboronic acid in combination with the dibrominated binol derivative, which is a protocol developed by the Zabo group, they were able to access two diastereomers of the product. The desired one, shown in green, was isolated and carried on. 
The undesired one was explored some more, but we'll come back to it in a minute. So, carrying on the desired diastereomer product, they protected the secondary alcohol using mom chloride and Hunig's base, then removed the tradial protecting group using formic acid. Now they were able to convert the primary alcohol to an aldehyde using the stall oxidation, which furnished the substrate they would need to carry out the ketial radical cyclization proposed earlier. At first, they found that treating with samarium diiodide and THF at zero degrees gave this ring open product, which we can imagine arise from a ketial radical addition initiating on the aldehyde, which would provide this samarium enolate after a second one electron reduction. The authors propose that it's this enolate that's leading to the fragmentation when it encounters oxygen, which leads to the formation of an alpha peroxy ketone that can fragment to lead to the product observed. So with that understanding of the situation, they spent time optimizing the conditions of the reaction and found that using these conditions and carrying out the reaction under rigorous deoxygenation, they were able to actually arrive at this desired radical cyclization product. Here I'll also stop briefly to point out that if the stereocenters we set during the earlier crotalation were reversed, the key radical cyclization takes a completely different course. Looking at this starting material, derived from the undesired diastereomeric product of the crotalation reaction, the authors found that this unique rearranged product formed. They proposed that this came about through the pathway shown, where the ketyl radical generated by the action of samarium diiodide now actually prefers to attack the alpha position of the enone rather than the beta position, which leads to formation and subsequent fragmentation of a cyclopropane ring through a dowd beckwith rearrangement. The authors proposed that this change in regioselectivity of the ketyl radical addition comes as a consequence of a conformational change that occurs due to strain minimization at the OMOM bearing stereocenter. The final intermediate generated through this process possesses a completely different ring system and was proposed to lead to the observed product after a further one electron reduction by samarium diiodide. Now the authors converted the ketone present in the product of the ketyl radical cyclization into a silylenol ether by treatment with LIHMDS and TIPS triflate. Here we arrive at another key moment in the synthesis, where the authors found that any attempt to reduce the 1,1 disubstituted alkene present in the starting material using traditional hydrogenation conditions with a cationic transition metal led to reduction of the monosubstituted alkene instead. To get around this issue, they used this manganese DPM complex, which allows a transannular 1,5 hydrogen atom transfer, which is proposed to go through this type of transition structure. Here they were able to determine that it is this hydrogen marked in red that's actually the one that's delivered to the 1,1 disubstituted alkane during this step by using a deuterium labeled substrate and checking where the deuterium appears in the product. So with that transformation, they were able to form a single diastereomer of the product, which could be treated with lithium and ammonia to regenerate the secondary alcohol with the same stereochemistry as before with high diastereoselectivity. Finally, they carried out a coupling reaction with a protected alpha hydroxy carboxylic acid followed by a global deprotection sequence which provided pluramutylin. The authors also demonstrated that the chemistry they developed following their earlier crotalation was also applicable to the synthesis of 12 epipluramutylin. To do this, they switched from the Z crotal bronic acid they used in the original route to the E crotal bronic acid. With that change, they were able to obtain the diastereomer they needed to access the C12 epimer of pluramutylin through essentially the same route they used to get to pluramutylin. Overall, I thought the synthesis was a fresh approach to this family of molecules and involved some very interesting and instructive steps, so I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks for joining us on another Total Synthesis episode. If you enjoyed it, please support us by liking and subscribing, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time!